The following is a special sports presentation. And Markin has won the national championship. On March 28, 1977 at the Omni in Atlanta, Georgia, Marquette won the NCAA Basketball Championship. It was Al McGuire's last game as Marquette's coach. Coming up, we'll hear from the players on that title team. We'll pay tribute to the late Al McGuire in his own words from rare extended interviews. And we'll show how the legacy of that championship team is still strong today. 30 years later, we remember Marquette's 77 champs. Hello, everyone. I'm Lance Allen. And I'm Dennis Krause. We're here at the Al McGuire Center on the Marquette University campus for a special reason, Dennis. Well, Lance, it's hard to believe it's been 30 years since Marquette won the NCAA basketball championship. And what a turbulent year it was. December of 1976, during that magical 76-77 season, Al McGuire announced that he was retiring and heading to Medalist Industries. Now, in February of 77, Marquette lost three straight home games, something unheard of for them at the time. They weren't even sure they were going to make the NCAA tournament at all. Back then, the tournament only 32 teams, so the Warriors entered the tournament with a 20-7 and record. On the road to the Omni in Atlanta, it wasn't all seashells and balloons. Al McGuire and Bernard Toon get into a fight at halftime of the Cincinnati game, and MU barely beats Kansas State by a point. Even after Marquette won the Midwest Regional over Wake Forest 82 to 68, punching a ticket to the Final Four, the drama continued. A controversial buzzer beater by Jerome Whitehead over UNC Charlotte, no goaltending called, that got Marquette into the title game. Now, I don't know, see my destiny, everybody won more for Al and all this stuff, and now here we are. The cries of win one for Al in his last game as a coach, never louder. I would like to know for coach as he retires to go out and win his last game, and for us to win the game and so forth, and for Marquette and for Mark and everybody. <laughs> Time to ring out Ahoya facing North Carolina for the title. The dynamite team, okay? Stay alive in the bank, play to the best of your ability. Go ahead, buddy, get it. The most outstanding player of the tournament had the most outstanding play. Butch Lee passed all five Tar Heel defenders coast to coast in a 15 point first half. Marquette led by 12 at the break, with McGuire calling it the best 20 minutes of basketball he'd ever seen. It looked like it wouldn't last, though, as North Carolina raced that lead in four minutes. But the Tar Heels went into a four-corner stall, lost momentum, and Marquette took control. McGuire sensed the victory, and as the clock ticked down on a 67-59 championship win, Al McGuire lost it, crying on the bench. Look at that. Uh, McGuire, I think, is crying. He won't let him it's tough for him to show his emotions. He would rather be out under his favorite tree all alone and, and thinking about this and counting the flowers and smelling a wonderful life. Thank you, Al McGuire. Oh, thank you for the many great moments you've given us. Meanwhile, the party in Atlanta is just getting started. The feeling is so great that you know everybody in the world was watching. Everybody know that you're number one. And uh, I'm just glad that I had a shot at it. And Marquette has been beautiful. And I never regret coming here, ever. I always dreamed about being a national champion, but it's so hard and you need so many breaks and last second shots. And it's just super, really. The happiness I feel, I really can't express it in words. And especially not at this time. I guess I have to wait a few days and you know let it set in and uh, you know to see what we've done. While the head coach in his swan song, simply was drained. You know, sometimes uh, the things you want the most are subconsciously, you don't allow yourself to uh, think them. You might dream them, but don't allow yourself to think them. What are you thinking right now? I'm thinking I've got a headache, and I, and I would like not to meet the crowd back in Milwaukee that's going to be in a carnival atmosphere. The attention has been so much on me the last two or three months, and hey, these, you know, I haven't scored a point yet. So that was Atlanta 30 years ago. It certainly takes you back, doesn't it, Dennis? The number one songs, March of 1977, Evergreen by Barbara Streisand and Rich Girl by Daryl Hall and John Oates. I was a freshman in high school at the time, <laughs> by the way. Well, let's fast forward to today. And earlier in March, there was a 30th anniversary celebration for the 77 team, and I caught up with a few of the guys at the Bradley Center. 30 years. Does it seem like 30 years? Yes and no. Uh, you know, I, I've been around, you know, for a while now, you know, as a player and then as a coach, 10 years as an assistant, then going to Chicago as a head coach and then coming back for two years. But uh, the only way I, I really can see the years go by is when I would look at my oldest daughter who was 28 years old. But as far 
as the time going by, you know, it, it just seems like yesterday. You look at that championship season, there was a time when it didn't look like you'd even be in the tournament. Can you talk about what a struggle that year was? Well, you know, I know a lot of people talk about that, but uh, since the summer before, uh, I thought we had a team to win the national title, and that was really uh, number one on my mind. Even as we lost some games during that, that year, uh, I never wavered. I thought we had a great team. I thought we could be the national champions. You know, everything was kind of coming together. You know, I thought Bo was playing at the top of his game. We had Jimmy Boyle and Whitehead. And uh, we, had a, we had a good team, and I think that that year, everybody was playing at the top of their game. We probably weren't the best team in the country the year we won the national title, probably in 76 when we only lost two games and didn't win the national title. That was probably a better team than the year when we won it on Al's last year. But we had that special something called chemistry. What are your favorite memories of Atlanta specifically? And that whole weekend and that Monday night? Probably um, when we pretty much knew the game was in hand and I was standing at half court and I really wasn't paying attention to the bench and Butch came up to me and put his arm around me and he pointed to coach and I saw coach over there crying and it was really the first time in the four years that we have spent together that I ever really saw him show emotion other than going crazy on the referees or getting mad at us I mean and um, I'll never forget that. Al's been gone now over six years how often do you think of him? Oh, all the time, you know. I learned more from coach about being a good person than I did about basketball. And he had that cliche, you use basketball, don't let basketball use you. Another thing, he always would say, whoever said that life was fair? You know, when I lost my daughter, you know, I used to think about what coach would always say, you know, things like that. And even now, you know, I have my good days and bad, and. You know, I always hear that little voice in my mind talking about that, and that helps me tremendously. Well, you know, I think about him a lot. You know, my office in San Juan, I have a couple of pictures of Al there in the office, so I see him pretty, I see him pretty often still, his picture. I think of Al a lot because uh, he was a very, very loyal friend of mine. Al and I always had kind of a distant, yet close, volatile relationship. It was a love-hate deal. Uh, he didn't always want to play me, but he didn't have a lot of guys that could shoot, so he didn't really have much of a choice. Every year since I graduated from Marquette, before Al passed away, I'd get a letter from Al McGuire Enterprises. And he'd be like, Rosie, save the swamps. You know, now that I know you have an 800 line, uh, you'll have a special place in my phone book forever. And he always stayed in touch. <laughs> what do you think the legacy is of that 77 team? I think we had great camaraderie. And uh, you know, when you're gonna go far in the, into the tournament, you have to have uh, good players and you have to have good people. And I think uh, that's probably our legacy. We had a great uh, group of guys. Certainly the reunion of the 77 team was bittersweet and incomplete. Al McGuire passed away on January 26, 2001. When we come back, we will hear the words of the legendary Al McGuire from himself. I am alone. Anyone who ever sees me 99% of the time, I'm alone and I enjoy that. Uh, I just can turn on. You put on the TV camera, I turn on. I'm a, a ham or whatever you want to call it, an actor. The Marquette 30th Anniversary NCAA Championship Special is brought to you by Schwanke Cast and Jewelers, Milwaukee Center for Independence, Steinhoffels, Aurora Healthcare, Midwest Airlines, and McCoy Contractors. Cette année, j'ai appris le français. Translation, this year I learned French. GMT Master 2. The year it takes to make one is nothing compared to the time it takes to deserve one. The road to recovery isn't always smooth or straight. To get patients back to their lives, hospitals sometimes send their most difficult cases to more advanced and better equipped hospitals, like Aurora St. Luke's. All hospitals want you to get well soon. We want you to get well sooner. That's why nearly 2,000 patients a year, more than any other hospital in Wisconsin, are transferred to St. Luke's. I'm Dan McCoy, and our family has been repairing and remodeling basements since 1956. Our family has worked together for many years, providing quality services 
through honesty and a teamwork approach. Our professional staff has helped over 20,000 satisfied customers. Experience counts. I may own the company, but they're the real McCoy. Call McCoy! McCoy, for 50 years, the trusted name. At the Milwaukee Center for Independence, we help people with special needs on the road to independence. Whether it's an older adult remaining independent at home, someone finding employment, making new friends and getting involved, or establishing a solid foundation for a lifetime of learning. It all starts here. The Milwaukee Center for Independence. Many paths, one goal, independence. They fly everywhere I want to go and everywhere I need to be. I think I'm one of the few people out there who always looks forward to flying. I know it's just an airline, but from my very first flight, it's felt like my airline. Midwest Airlines, simply the best care in the air. What people, I guess, don't understand about me is I am a perfectionist in my own way. But I never allow it, you know, my hair, I'm not dressed, I'm this and that, the phantom, you know, mystique about me and so on. No, you don't. Uh, there's no such thing as luck in my life and never has been. Luck goes out the window when the element of time comes in. And you can't be lucky for 40 some odd years. Al certainly had a way with words, whether it was seashells and balloons or walking barefoot through the wet grass. <laughs> Only he could say it the way he said it. Well, and that brings to mind a couple of interviews that I was lucky enough to do with Al back in the early 90s at his office. We happened to catch him in some great moods where he was reflecting about his career. Here's Al McGuire in his own words. A lot of people give me more credit and intelligence than I have. My only intelligence is street smart. I'm extremely uh, a road scholar of common sense, but I'm not an intelligent person as far as uh, what the world looks at as intelligent, whether corporate or, uh, or academic type of intelligence. They said, fine, uh, you could have the job, and um, a two-year contract. And the, um, but they didn't know that, uh, that I knew my business and that um, you pretty much can pencil something in when I say it. Pat Smith is in his middle 40s now, but he was the first guy to ever recruit it for Marquette. I remember I recruited him because um, I watched him on a blacktop in, uh, in Harlem playing. He got a good cut in the eye, and uh, he didn't leave the game. And he was wearing a sailor's hat. And I said, well, I got to start out there at Marquette, so I need tough guys. So that's how I got Pat Smith, and that's how the merry-go-round started. We became a dynasty. And um, as you look back, and you know, everyone, as you get this moss on, you already become a Q-tip gray, you know. And uh, as you get uh, this moss on, you, people don't want to hear about yesteryear, because I very seldom talk about yesteryear. But we were so good, Dennis, that it was frightening. Never mind the players and me and the staff and the student body and fans and so forth, but we took on the world. We took on every set of zebras because we were surly, obnoxious, and arrogant. And the team was an extension of me. So we really took on a whole, a whole establishment. Marquette University basketball was the most disciplined team in basketball. If you would remember, Dennis, that we took city kids that were blue plate specials and we made them so disciplined on the court that you knew exactly what was going on at all times. We didn't take a bad shot, not in a game, in a year, a whole year. And people say, oh, what are you talking about? No, 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 don't take a bad shot on the court was no hanky-panky, no baloney. Before it, fine. If um, Maurice Lucas wanted to strut around the court, beautiful. If Goose Brell wanted to twitch during the national anthem, beautiful. If Lloyd Walton wanted to yell at me, beautiful. Larry McNeil's wife wanted to have a, a fight with Andy, beautiful. But on the court, nothing beautiful. No thrills. You do exactly. And that's the thing that only the great 
minds in basketball spotted and still remember. We played a very dreary game, very, very dreary game. But when you win, it's like a big eraser. It's like having Kareem Abdul-Jabbar play for you. That's what winning is. He's the eraser. Our eraser in those 13 years was winning. I mean, we constantly win. But I had players. I didn't realize they were that good. So when I was coaching, I thought it was me that was doing it. I didn't realize until I get out that, that I had all these great, great, great players. And they, and they were great. But they, they worried more about me than I did about them. We had a love affair, but it wasn't a love affair, I'm talking now my, my ball players, it wasn't a love affair of hugging and squeezing. It was a love affair of when you were in the minus pool or when you were stuck, I was there. But don't bother me over a misdemeanor. You know, don't bother me over a parking ticket or books late for the library or a haircut. You bothered me over something of quality. I was a physical coach. I was a coach that um, willed you to win. I made you mentally tough. I made you, when you stepped up in that foul line at the end of the game, that a piece of cake, baby. I'm not the easiest guy in the world to, um, uh, to get along with because I don't like meetings. I like to react off a reaction. I, um, I enjoy the moment. Um, I like uh, things that quiver. I like things that are exciting. Basketball is not going to be my life. And that's how come in the, my middle 40s, I'm now 46, I think I was, something like that, I, uh, uh, I retired from basketball. And everyone thought I was using it as a wedge to get more money and, uh, or to, you know, most people wedge, and I'm not against wedging, but I've learned years ago, if you carry a gun, you better shoot it or don't carry it, you know, never say anything to someone unless you're going to do it. And the, uh, uh, but no, the, it, it was time. I, if I knew I was going to win the championship, I would have stayed another year, if I knew that. It would have been nice to defend it, but I didn't know how to get back in. All in all, it's been great. I, uh, uh, but you know what life is, and you know what happiness is? It's always a little more. You know, Lance, through the years, I've really been lucky and had a chance to talk to a lot of different sports figures. Nobody, nobody compares to Al McGuire in my mind. He was truly unique. When we come back, we will talk to his longtime assistants, Hank Raymonds and Rick Majerus. Well, obviously, we all think that we're great people. You know, I think I'm fair. You know, Hitler and Mussolini thought they were fair. I, mean, I don't think anyone doesn't think they're a good person. But it's, uh, but all I know is that intentionally, Intentionally, I never hurt anybody in my life. I, pro I have hurt people, but it wasn't intentionally. When it comes to trust. We can always count on Channel 4. Today's TMJ4 hears you loud and clear. The reporters have so much integrity. They don't forget that there's a human side to the news. Mike Jacobs. He comes across as a trustworthy person. Carol Meekins. Carol Meekins has a great heart. When it's time to make the choice. You guys have been right on the money. Trust today's TMJ4. We automatically just turn the four. Live at 10. That's it. Today's TMJ4, that's it. At Lexus North Shore and Lexus of Brookfield, we want you to know you never have to settle for the ordinary. With three children, all in car seats, I needed a family car and I did not want to compromise on luxury. They're great to work with uh, on the sales side as well as the service side, and they know what they're doing back there. As a professional and as a small business owner, it's important to project the right image, and certainly that's the case when you own a Lexus. I would never settle for anything other than a Lexus. I would never settle. Never, ever settle for the ordinary. Lexus North Shore and Lexus of Brookfield. The new spring furniture fashions have arrived at Steinhoffel's along with special introductory savings. Right now, you can save $200 on this new lane reclining sofa, now just $6.99. This nine-piece counter height dining set is only $7.99. This is new. This is new. This is new. Hundreds of items are new with introductory savings throughout the store. Get next day delivery with no money down and no interest for 18 months on furniture that will last a lifetime. Relax at Steinhoffel's. Do we have Honda ATVs? You bet. Do we have Honda motorcycles? As far as the eye can see. Do we have more Hondas than we know what to do with? Oh, we know what we're going to do with them. 
We're going to sell them all. And right now at Cedar Creek Motorsports, get a brand new 05 Honda VTX 1300 for an incredible $69.95. Get Honda. Performance first. Advice from the experts and our low price guarantee. Exclusively where the riders go. Cedar Creek Motorsports, Highway 60 in Cedarburg. Welcome back to Marquette 77 Champs and here at the Al McGuire Center where we remember Al McGuire and the glorious run that was 30 years ago. We've heard from the late Al McGuire, but Al would have been the first to tell you that he had an awful lot of help. From assistant coach Hank Raymonds through all 13 years that Al was the coach here at Marquette, and then in the later years from Rick Majerus. And of course, Hank Raymonds had the greatest stories to tell of his association with Al McGuire, including one where he almost coached the national championship game. We stay so far out in the boondocks, and Al rented a motorcycle and took off, and we had no idea either. We found out that the thing had broken down mm. where he went, but he just, he made it just in time. Mm. Time for the game. I was waiting, though, I was ready. Raymond's was <laughs> next to McGuire every step of the journey, from when he walked onto the Marquette campus in 1964 to succeeding him as coach. Al knew this team was special. This was one of his favorite teams. Not because he won, he really liked these guys. And uh, he's, he gave them hell all year because he said he didn't think they could go. They were good enough to go to a tournament, hmm. even the NIT. Rick Majerus joined the staff in 1971 and still felt like the hitchhiker on the road to the title in 77. I think of Al and, and how happy I was for him and how happy I was for Hank. Hank was such a big part of that. I was more like a cabana boy, you know, um, you know, I was just along for the ride. For Majerus, the McGuire known for his street smarts will never get the recognition for his court smarts. Al was a fantastic coach, self-deprecating, and really not given the acclaim that he perhaps should have been for being a great impro improv guy. Al closed zone, showed some big kahunas, said, you know what, I'm gonna stay with this zone primarily. He threw in a little man-to-man -man out of timeouts to keep him off balance, mm -hmm. and that was a stroke of genius. A lot of guys are afraid to go outside the box, or they wanna do the, the college thing, right. or the media thing, so to speak, too. They take safe haven. Raymond's just savors those final seconds with a side of McGuire rarely seen. When those final seconds were ticking off, there's the famous shot of Al crying and you're kind of pumping your fist. Well, describe just, that moment. I never thought I'd ever see him cry. <laughs> but he really was. He was very emotional. And uh, this is, this was the other side of Al. People, uh, he really is an introvert. I don't mm -hmm. care what they say. You know, that was all put on, all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but uh, he really enjoyed this one. And remember, in a 32-team tournament, MU barely made it into the dance, something Raymond's thanks his lucky stars for every day. There's no way this team should even have gone to that tournament. Mm -hmm. Now, when you look and think of the rules, if the rules were what they are now, mm -hmm. there's no, now we, no doubt we wouldn't have gone. When you look back on it now, is it almost like a Cinderella story? Yeah, it is. It has to be. But we were good. But, uh, but the team, my friend, since the other one, it went to the final with the North Carolina State. That was a given. These guys, we knew that they were good enough. To, but we didn't even know if we were going to go. But to have what happened with this team, who should not even have been there, I think it's a heck of a story. But Dennis Majerus likes to downplay his role in the team, but obviously he became a great coach in his own right due to what he learned under Al McGuire. No question about it. When we come back, the legacy lives on. As we go to a break, though, let's hear from Marquette's all-time leading scorer, George Thompson. He wasn't on that 77 team, but certainly felt a lot of pride about it. Oh, yeah, I was there, no question about it. Uh, my wife and I were there. And matter of fact, we flew down with the team, and uh, it was such a feeling of, Here's what all of those years have led up to. And I think all of the guys that came previously felt that they were a part of this thing and helped this thing come to the crescendo that it did in Atlanta. The Marquette 30th Anniversary NCAA Championship Special is brought to you by Schwanke Cast and Jewelers, Milwaukee Center for Independence, Steinhoffels, Aurora Healthcare, Midwest Airlines, and McCoy Contractors. I'm Dan McCoy, and our family has been repairing and remodeling basements since 1956. Our family has worked together for many years, providing quality services through honesty and a teamwork approach. Our professional staff has helped over 20,000 satisfied customers. 
experience counts. I may own the company, but they're the real McCoy. Go McCoy! McCoy, for 50 years, the trusted name. Cancer surgery this morning. Coffee with a friend this afternoon. That's the miracle of the CyberKnife radio surgery system, which destroys cancer cells without incisions or damage to surrounding tissue, enabling many patients to get back to their lives the very same day. All hospitals want you to get well soon. We want you to get well sooner. That's why you'll find Wisconsin's only CyberKnife at Aurora St. Luke's. At the Milwaukee Center for Independence, we help people with special needs on the road to independence. Whether it's an older adult remaining independent at home, someone finding employment, making new friends and getting involved, or establishing a solid foundation for a lifetime of learning, it all starts here. The Milwaukee Center for Independence. Many paths, one goal, independence. This year I fell in love again. with the same woman. The Rolex day date and lady date just. The year it takes to make one is nothing compared to the time it takes to deserve one. They fly everywhere I want to go and everywhere I need to be. I think I'm one of the few people out there who always looks forward to flying. I know it's just an airline, but from my very first flight, it's felt like my airline. Midwest Airlines, simply the best care in the air. Belmont Abbey was the launcher. It was the, the thing that launched the rocket. Uh, Marquette University in Milwaukee, it gave me the opportunity to become um, a marquee. And then um, NBC, after it was over, gave me um, a second safe deposit box. <laughs> His friends always said Al was good with a dime or a couple of dollars or something like that. Welcome back to the Al McGuire Center and Marquette 77 Champs. Yeah, Al can summarize his career like nobody else there, as you saw. But, you know, the legacy lives on today. Oh, it definitely does under Tom Crean and the current players on the Marquette Golden Eagles. When you first came here, what did 1977 mean to you? Well, it meant a lot because it's one of my first memories of college basketball. I mean, I can still vividly remember sitting at, at, at our home in, in Mount Pleasant, Michigan, watching the game and, and just being into it. I certainly remember Coach McGuire's reaction afterwards, and I became a Marquette fan from that point on. Arriving in 1999, Kareen immediately sought the advice of McGuire. But typical of Al, the conversation didn't quite go down an expected path. When you had the moments to talk with Al when you were first here, mm -hmm. what were those moments like? What did you usually talk about? We talked about a lot of different things. We didn't talk about that team very much. We talked about coaching. We talked about uh, you know Marquette, Milwaukee. Uh, a lot of different things. He gave me so much advice on, on uh, dealing with supporters and fans and media, and we just had very relaxed, casual conversations, and I took a lot from all of them. Crean made just one mistake with Al. The only tough thing I had was riding with him a couple times, and you're not quite sure if you're going to stop at the stoplight or when you're going to leave the stoplight. But other than that, you know, I enjoyed every minute of it. Today's players weren't around during the title run, but they realize it when they step foot on the campus. Not until I got here did I realize the uh, just the history and, and the magnitude of all this. But it's got to be pretty cool. And it's great to be. A, it's world. great to be a part of. You know, and you just want to keep on and, and continue the legacy that they built. And while most coaches distance themselves from the greatness of the past, Crean embraced it. He gave you permission. Gave me permission not to worry about what he did. Not to worry about the era that he was here in. I mean, he just do your own thing. And he, and he really kept talking about how different it is now, you know, versus versus when he was coaching. And now Crean has taken the Marquette program to heights never thought possible with his own style. Greatest mistake anybody could ever make is trying to imitate and, and become somebody. You can learn a lot from those people, and I think I definitely did. But, but uh, I, I, I felt like I really understood what he was talking about, you know, and I know people kept saying, well, did you 
Did you get this or did you get that? I kind of got it all. One thing's for sure, Lance, 30 years later, Marquette's NCAA champs certainly still worth remembering. Hard to believe it's been that long, but it was special. Thanks for watching, everyone. For more on Al McGuire in his own words, just click on todaystmj4.com.